So the next thing that I'm going to talk about is a little bit more on the subject of AAA. So what we went through was an example when AAA was used for PPP authentication. This is just one of the situations that you might encounter in the lab. One of the uh, more likely ones is that you are asked to do PPP authentication for uh, login services. So when a user interactively tries to log in, when you try to log in to your devices. For that purpose, we are going to uh, work on, oh, let me uh, use a uh, different color there. So for that purpose, we are going to continue configuring our uh, R7 there. Oh, actually, let me see if it's going to be R7 and R8. Actually, I will be using R8 for this purpose. So on R8, I want to uh, continue with my uh, AAA authentication um, configuration, but I want to change it to be a little, little different. So this is going to be the task to configure on R8. So configure R8 for login authentication on VTY, and here I'm talking about lines 0 to 4 and console lines. Users logging in using Telnet and SSH should Telnet Telnet, let's say, um, SSH and on the console should be authenticated using the radius server at 3333 key IP expert. This radius server should never be used for any other authentication purposes. So let me uh, move this around a little bit. Sorry, just want to move this R8 a little bit here. It should never be used for any other authentication purpose. If this radius is not available, within five seconds of the initial authentication request, R8 should use the local case sensitive database. Now, locally, uh, or I should say um, user IP expert with password IP expert should never be authenticated by the radius server and instead should always be authenticated locally. All users should have privilege level assigned using the method they were authenticated by, local or radius. So this is the task on the, this would be for three points. I can make it a four pointer if you like. So uh, would you like to, to see the four pointer? This is going to be a tricky one. So you have a choice here. Do you want to continue with the three pointer or uh, we want to see the example of four points? Four points, okay. Very, very simple request. All other users, or, or I should say all users that were configured for PPP should not be allowed interactive access to the R8. Now, you may remember that in a previous example, there was a uh, user router 7 that was also locally defined and this user should not be allowed interactive access to R8. So if you try to log in, the authentication should either fail or something else should happen that will prevent the user from actually interactively working on this device. So this is the, uh, the task. I'm just going to uh, copy it to, um, to my notepad so that I have a copy of it so that I can reference it later on. I'm going to put it 
on my other screen and let's then see what needs to be done here. The first thing that I'm going to do, of course, is, oh, let me, uh, I'm going to connect to uh, R8. I won't be needing these. I'm going to connect to R8 and I'm also going to be needing R7. So let me uh, bring it back in. So the first thing here that I have to recognize is what actually needs to be done. Now, there is an important clue here and that is that this is applying for both VTY and console line. So everything here that says needs to apply to all of these lines. So it needs to happen on the console and when someone is remotely accessing this. Now, another important clue is SSH. Now, this tells me implicitly that I actually have to configure and enable SSH on this box. Now, would you like me to make this four and a half points worth? I can make it even just a little bit more complicated. It is going to uh, add an interesting twist. Of course, there is not going to be a four and a half pointer and do not configure any domain names on R8. So, we know that the usual way of configuring SSH is to create a host name, create the define the domain, IP domain name, whatever. But here we are told, do not configure any domain names. So how can we enable SSH without actually configuring a domain name? That's going to be an interesting twist. So let's start by making sure that we can telnet from R7 to R8, that we can actually log in there and then let's attack the SSH. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to define the username, IP expert, password, IP expert. Again, remember, don't use the question mark at the end because that will add the space. Then I'm going to go to line VTY 04 and I'm going to make sure that Telnet actually works. And then from R7, I'm going to Telnet there and I'm going to try to log in as IP expert, IP expert. This should work, right? So at this point, I am testing whether just the basic functionality work. Now, you might remember that we do have AAA configured on R8, but this configuration is not affecting the login authentication because there is nothing I have done with the login authentication. So we see that the Telnet works. It should also work from the console, but there is no really need to test that, but we can. I can log in there. There is no login by default on the console. So this is the default behavior, but I still have full access to my box. The next thing that I want to do is I want to enable SSH. So I know that I can do it with creating the domain name, but this is what's something that I'm not allowed to do. So let's see what I can do. I need to generate the key. So I'm going to say crypto key generate RSA. I'm going to say, that I want 1024 bits in the key there. And now, instead of using the domain, I can use the label. So the label here can be, for example, ipexpert.com. So now when I create this, um, actually, let me, um, just instead of doing that, uh, let's say r8.ipexpert.com, for example. So you can see that whatever I use as the label is going to end up being the name. So I can also say just R8 there, and that is going to be the label for the key. This is why the domain name is used, because the domain name is used to generate this label by default. But I can specify what I want to be the label, and I don't need to specify the domain name. So that's one, let's call it a trick that you can use to get around uh, uh, specifying the domain for SSH. So now I have created this, uh, uh, this key and the first one that I generated actually enabled SSH functionality. But what I need to do, because I've used transport input telnet here, I have automatically turned all other forms of transport. So what I need to do is I need to add the SSH to the list. Now let's do the same thing on R7, but here instead of uh, using the label, let's use the IP domain name. And here I'm going to say crypto key generate RSA. Uh, 
let's say, uh, module 1024. So now here, you see how the domain name was used here to generate the fully qualified domain name of the router. This is what we need the domain, but this is really just the key label. So here on R8, I manually set the label to be just R8, and here I use the domain name to implicitly generate the label. So now let's see if SSH actually works. So I'm going to say SSH minus L IP expert, 192.168.78.8. So when I go there, it's going to ask me for a password, IP expert, and I can actually log in using SSH. So SSH has been enabled on R8, and I have enabled it as a test on R7. Mind you, there were no restrictions about the domain name on R7, so this is a perfectly legitimate configuration. So now we have done basically the Telnet and SSH, we can access there, and now we have to look at these more advanced configurations. So the thing to worry about here is this part of the requirement that says that the radius that we are using for this task should never be used for any other authentication purpose. Now, you remember that on R8, we actually did have radius server defined, and here it is. It's the, the complicated setup that uh, we needed to do 17 or 18 times to get it right to uh, define the radius server on 2222. Now, in this task here, we are told that this new radius server that we will be using must not be used for any other purpose. Now, if I go and define a new radius server, just like I did this one, what's going to happen for PPP authentication? This server will be consulted first, and when it times out, we are going to go to the second server. And this is precisely what we need to avoid. And this is where something else that I mentioned earlier today is going to come into play. So here that I mentioned very, very briefly that in the list of methods that you can use, you can have a locally defined group name. This is precisely the functionality that we need at this point. Because what we need to do now is we need to define our own group of radio servers, which is going to consist of a single server, 3333, so that this server is not part of the radius uh, group, it's only going to be part of this private group of ours. Let me configure it first and then explain how it actually works. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say AAA server group, actually AAA server radius, no, sorry, AAA group server radius, and I give it a name, let's call it my radius. And here I'm just going to say server dash private 3333, and I'm going to say, um, what was it, uh, timeout 5, retransmit zero and key IP expert. So if I take a look at the configuration, this is what I have configured right now. Now, let me explain how this actually works. So when we use the radius server, when we define in the global configuration mode, when we say radius and this also applies to TACACs, but I'm going to use radius as an example. So radius server host, whatever the command is, no matter how many of these you actually define, so let's say that we have more than just one, so let's say that we have defined several of these, these are automatically going to be part of group radius. Now, you can create your own group. So when we create AAA group server radius, and here we define name, we can here either reference one of these. If we, for example, just say server x, that would be this x, and let's say that this is y here. That means that part of this group name, uh, we are uh, one of the globally defined radio servers is going to be part of this group. But we can also define the server that is going to be just available 
in this group, which is server private, which has very similar syntax to what we have in the global configuration, but these privately defined servers are not actually part of group radius. They are only defined within this private group. So this is exactly what I need right now, this precise functionality. I need to define the server 3333 that is going to be only available in my locally defined group. And my locally defined group in this case is called my radius. So when I say AAA authentication login, instead of saying group radius like I did here, I'm going to say group my radius, which in turn will only use the privately defined server 3333. Now, I don't care about the authentication and the accounting ports because the task never said anything about that. I do care about the timeout 5 because if I read the task here, it says that radius, if the radius is not available within 5 seconds of the initial authentication request, RH should use the local case sensitive database. So this is why I'm going to say timeout 5, so it's going to wait for 5 seconds, and I'm not going to send any retransmits because it never said anything about retransmits. I could also configure, say, timeout 4 and have one retransmit, or timeout 2 and have, two, uh, have one retransmit which would come up to, uh, to 4 seconds in total, but that's just, you know, doing something that the task never asked. The simpler you solve it, the better. So this is the configuration I'm going to have for that radio server. So this takes care of actually defining the radius server that is not going to be used for any other authentication purpose. But here we now to say, have to say, user IP expert with password IP expert should never be authenticated by the radius and instead should always be authenticated locally. This is tricky because what's going to happen is if I have my command defined as say triple A authentication authentication, login, let's say default, and I say group my radius, and then local case, what's going to happen is, let's say that the user IP expert logs in, attempts to log in. What's going to happen, because group my radius is defined first, this is where we are going to go for the authentication purpose. When this is not available, we are going to fall back to using the local case. Well, this is the problem because we do not want user IP expert to go to radius at all. We want user IP expert to go to local case and everyone else to actually go to group radius. So in order to solve this, I actually have to do things a little bit upside down. What I need to do here is I need to first say local case and then group my radius. Now let me explain how that works. Let's say that the user IP expert, which is defined locally, comes in for authentication. We are first going to go here and authenticate against local case. If the user IP expert is authenticated, the password will be verified. If it's correct, the user is authenticated. If it's incorrect, we're going to get login incorrect. But let's say that the user Marco, which is not defined locally, comes in for authentication. So it comes in here, and because it's not authenticated locally, we are still going to be asked for a password, but we know that this authentication is going to fail, but what iOS is internally going to do is going to say, for user Marco, the local case authentication is invalid, go to the next authentication method. So we are actually going to go to the radius, and this happens instantaneously. Now, keep in mind that the other way around, it doesn't happen. If radius responds, it will respond with login failed even if the user is not actually defined in the radius database. If the user is not defined in the radius database and we get login failure from the radius, in this case here, the group radius authentication actually worked. The user failed authentication, so there will never be a fallback in that particular case. 
it's only uh, this behavior that I described for this part here is available only when you are using a local database as the first entry, local or local case. So in our case, in order to solve the requirements of the task here, that user IP expert should never be authenticated by the radius server and instead should always be authenticated locally, what we need to do is first use local case and then use the group my radius for authentication. If we use it otherwise, we are not going to satisfy the requirements of this task. So let's go in and uh, type this in. So I'm going to say AAA authentication login and let's use the default in this case, the default authentication list. So I'm going to say local case and then group my radius. So at this point here, if I try to log in from R7, so telnet 1.2.168.78.8, let's on R8 say debug radius authentication just to see what happens. And I'm going to try to log in as user IP expert, IP expert. See, I'm logged in immediately and on R8 there was no output. Why? Because the radio server was never consulted for this authentication. But let's try to log in as someone else. Let's try to log in, for example, as Marco. Marco. If I go to R8, the radius request goes out, and we can see here that it goes out only to 3333. Now we are going to wait for five seconds for it to, oh, actually, sorry, I needed to, uh, to scroll a little bit. So five seconds elapsed, and we can see that by the timer. So there was a 44 here on the clock, and there is 49 here when it happened. So exactly five seconds later, we get no response from 3333, that's this line here, the authentication fails. There is no fallback in this case, and we get authentication failed. Now, this satisfies that requirement or those requirements, but let's take a look at this requirement here. Now, I know that we have to take care of the privilege levels, but this one here is much more fun. It says, all users that were configured for PPP should not be allowed interactive access to R8. Do not configure any domain names on R8. So we have already taken care of this, and it's actually unrelated to this requirement. It's part of something else. But let me show you what I mean by this. So if I tell it to R8, and if I try to log in as router 8, sorry, not router 8, now we have to wait for radius to time out. It's actually router 7. This other locally defined user. So we have this user with password IP expert. So I'm going to try to log in as that user. So router 7 IP expert. You see, I'm interactively logged in. This must not happen. This is exactly what I'm trying to avoid. So how can I solve that problem? Well, as it turns out, there is a little trick that you can do. So username router7, I'm going to say auto command logout. Basically, what this does is as soon as the user successfully logs in, he's going to be logged out. So let's try this now. This probably won't work, and I'll explain why. So you see, I'm now in. The auto command did no effect. This is because this is not part of the authentication. This is part of the authorization. Now, the difference between authentication and authorization is authentication establishes the identity of the user. Who are you? That's the question it asks. Now, the authorization is, what is it that you are allowed to do? And this is exactly what this user is allowed to do. This auto command. This is what we want to authorize or authorize the user to do. So what we need to do here is actually enable the AAA authorization on our lines. So I'm going to say AAA authorization, and this is part of the exec process because this is the interactive login. This is what I want to control here. And I'm going to use the default list. And here again, I have uh, multiple options. And what I want to do is basically replicate whatever I had for authentication. So let me, uh, before I type this in, so show run include AAA. So what I want to do is basically replicate this. If the user was authenticated using the local database, then use the local database to assign uh, the authorization. And if the radius was used, use the radius. So I'm going to say AAA authorization exec 
default and then basically just copy paste these two entries here. Actually there is no local case, there is only a, a local here. So if I do show run section AAA, this is what I'm seeing now for the authorization. So now if I try to log in as router-7 and user IP expert, sorry, password IP expert, let me, you see, I was able to log in, but what happened immediately? I was logged out. And even if I try SSH, so let's try SSH, SSH minus L router-7, so I'm going to be asked about the password, IP expert, login, and immediately logged out. So technically speaking, the user is allowed to log in, but we are not allowing him interactive access because the authorization that runs the logout command prevents this user from being logged in. It's an interesting trick you can play. But the user IP expert, on the other hand, if I log in as him, actually, sorry, I need to uh, change the user, IP expert, this user is unaffected. So let's say that privilege level here tells me I'm on privilege level one. So let's make sure that we satisfy these requirements here. It says all users should have privilege levels assigned using the method they were authenticated by, local or radius. So to test this, let's try to give our user IP expert privilege level of 15. So if I go here and I say, um, uh, do show run section username. Where is my user IP expert? There he is. So here I'm going to say privilege level 15. If I try to log in from R7 as user IP expert, I will see that my privilege level is 15. So this is all good. And actually I'm going to stay logged in now from R8 and the reason for that is sorry, from R7. The reason for that is that now I need to test the same thing on the console of R8. And if I log out from the console and I'm not enabled over that SSH or Telnet session, and if I cannot come back in, this could very well mean the end of my lab. And I don't want to lock myself out. So the best way to avoid that is Telnet or SSH from some other device, enable and enter the configuration mode so that you can correct any errors if they may exist and then log out from the console. So now on R8 I'm being asked for a username. I'm going to log in as router 7 IP expert and look what happens. From console I'm actually able to log in as router 7. So I have just lost four points because one thing that I did not pay attention to here bit me. It says console lines. It keeps repeating console lines. So everything that this task talks about needs to happen on VTY lines and on the console. And console behaves in a different way. So how does it behave in a different way? Well, for one, the authorization on the console is not enabled by default. And you can go to the console and you can say, Authorization default, oh, sorry, exec default, I'm sorry. But then you're going to get a friendly reminder that this is actually meaningless without this global command. So what I need in the global configuration mode, this is what I need to enter. So now my local, auth my local authorization will actually work. So if I now try to log in as router 7, I will be immediately logged out. If I try to log in as IP expert, I can get in and if I type show privilege, my privilege level is now 15. So as far as I'm concerned, in your routing and switching CCI lab, the AAA will not get more complicated than this. So these are, these were the two examples of the, uh, the level of depth that you need to understand the AAA and, and kind of questions that you might expect to see in the lab. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to save these configurations and I'm going to see if you have any questions. So one of the questions here is, should I always enter AAA authentication logging default none? My answer to that is no, don't do it. Now the recommendation to, to do 
to enter that command. And just a reminder, the command is AAA authentication login default none. Basically, what this does is it turns off the authentication for login service. That means that the users will not be asked for username and password, no matter what is configured. This changes the behavior of login, uh, of the login authentication, to, in, in a way that might not be what the grading script expects. If they don't ask you to do this, don't do it. If they ask you to do something about the login authentication, like, for example, things that we have done here, username and triple uh, eight. So if you have been asked to do something about the login authentication, that command triple A authentication login none or triple A authentication login default none will actually turn this behavior off. So it would be damaging there. The recommendation to use that command is to prevent the script from being locked out and to prevent yourself from being locked out. But I have a much better suggestion. Know what you are doing and you will not lock yourself out. So remember the advice that I've given you. Before you actually log out from the device that you are configuring something on, so in our case R8, log in from some other device. So here I'm going to log in from R7. I'm going to log in as IP expert. So you can see I am now on R8. I'm going to go into the config terminal. So now I can actually fix the errors and only now test on R8 whether you can log back in. Because if you cannot log back in, you know what? You're already logged in, you're already enabled, and you can fix the problem, right? There is another approach, uh, slightly more brute force, and requires careful timing. So let's say now that I have configured all of my AAA. I, I have saved the configurations, but let's say that you have just finished the configurations. So you exit from the config mode, you don't save the configurations, you say reload in five, say that you don't want to uh, save the configurations, and then you have scheduled the reload in five minutes. Log out and try to log back in. If you cannot log back in, you just wait for about four or five minutes and the router will reboot. If you can log in, you say reload cancel and you have just canceled the reload, save the configs and you're done. So this is yet another way you can avoid locking yourself out. But my suggestion is know what you're doing and you will not lock yourself out.